am Dr. Frank Summers of the Office of Public Outreach. Uh, when you came in, you got a brand new lithograph, I hope you got a brand new lithograph, of Supernova 1987A. Uh, and this is uh, in particular discussing what Supernova 1987A looks like 30 years after the explosion. There's a lot of things that don't change in astronomy over the course of a lifetime. Supernovae, they're one of the things that actually do change over the course of your lifetime. Flip over on the back and you can read some of the changes that we have learned and all about us and we still have more cool stuff that we're going to learn from watching Supernova 1980s develop. It's just changed from one phase into the other phase in around 2016, so it's a cool time to be watching it and we'll continue to watch it as long as we have telescopes to look at it. All right, tonight's talk will be active luminous blue variables in the large Magellanic clouds. It's a mouthful, but Nolan will explain it in great detail for you tonight. Uh, next month, we have a really, really cool talk, Cassini's grand finale at Saturn, and I'll tell you just a little bit more about, about that during the news summary. Uh, Bonnie is our Saturn and Saturn ring expert here in the building. Uh, so uh, I twisted her arm. Actually, I gave her no choice. I said, look, you've just got to do this. And she was like, yeah, I guess I got to do it. Okay, so we'll do that. And then November and December haven't been scheduled because astronomers don't respond to your emails over the summer break. Um, I'm waiting. <laughs> Seriously, I waited until after uh, Labor Day, and now I'm sending out the email tomorrow, and I'll have those and the rest of the schedule filled out relatively soon. If you want to find out about what that schedule is, you can go to our website, uh, use your favorite search engine, and put in Hubble Public Talks, and you'll find the upcoming lectures listed here. You can also watch live. Here are the links to the live webcasting, the archives of the webcasting back to over 10 years of talks, um, and you can sign up for the email announcements, which will remind you each month of uh, who's, who's talking. All right, um, as I said, the announcements, you can sign up at the website. If you do not like going to websites and you want to just hand me a piece of paper with your email, uh, that also works as well. Um, if you have comments or questions, just send them to publiclecture at stsci.edu and uh, I or one of my colleagues will respond. Social media. We have Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Instagram channels uh, that are officially supported and have regular uh, posts on them. We have my stuff, which is my blog, my Facebook, Google, and Twitter, which are not regularly updated. Um, I pr in particular, the last month I've been traveling a lot. I don't think I've put anything up in the last three weeks, uh, but I will make up for it this month probably uh, as I start to get my Eclipse stuff put out there. Uh, guess what? There's no observing tonight. <laughs> um, uh, those of you carrying umbrellas in understand this. Um, but um, they have, a Maryland Space Grant Consortium has just redone their website, um, and they have observatory status right on their um, uh, page for the Morris W. Offit Telescope. So if you go to their page, md.spacegrant.org, click on observing, you'll get this page. Um, and it will tell you what the status is for this Friday, September, what does that say, 8th? Yes. Um, and it says check back Friday at 5 p.m. to find out if the observatory will be open, okay? So the staff will update this at 5 p.m. You can come in and you can actually do a longer observing session on the Friday nights than you get to do after this, especially tonight since you won't be able to do it tonight. Okay. All right, now let's do our news from the universe for September 2017. Anybody want to guess what the first story is? <laughs> it is, of course, the Eclipse-O-Rama. Um, so the question I most got was, did you go on vacation to see the eclipse? And my answer was, of course, no. I did not go on vacation to see the eclipse. I went on vacation to see Yellowstone National Park and answer the ultimate question of where does a 2,000 pound bison walk? <laughs> answer is, of course, everybody together, anywhere he wants. Um, this guy here decided he was going to walk across the street and right through the parking lot, I mean in between cars in the parking lot, 
he wasn't more than 20 feet away. Uh, we saw some moose. There's a, a mother moose and her calf eating lunch in a pond. Uh, this is the Grand Canyon of the Yellowstone, the Lower Falls. And we saw geysers, geysers, and more geysers. Uh, we had a really great weekend. Actually, we left the geysers to last, and we just got like 10 geysers in, uh, in two, uh, great eruptions in two days. Uh, and then, of course, my favorite, which we saved really till, till the last, was Grand Prismatic Spring. Uh, how many of you have seen this? I mean, it's just so technicolor, you really almost, even, even now you go, what that, was that real? Yeah, it really was real. Those colors really are real. Uh, and so we had a fantastic vacation in Yellowstone because eclipses could be clouded out. So on the way, after, uh, after we finished our vacation in Yellowstone, we dropped down into Idaho, and it was totality or bust, as we saw in this one car in Idaho. Um, we went to Rexburg, Idaho, and they threw a festival. Uh, they had a hundred tents and vendors and food trucks. They had they gave over their whole public park to to camping. They probably had fifty to one hundred people camping out for the weekend, um, and. The movie theaters were very, very on the ball. They put up signs like this. The 3D glasses at this theater are not safe for viewing the solar eclipse. <laughs> the Mini Mart had an eclipse sale for the three days around the eclipse. I mean, it was, it was just fun to have people get involved in it. And so I, being my first sol total solar eclipse I'd ever seen, just sat back, relaxed, and did not use my 3D glasses. I used my actual solar viewing glasses and sat back and enjoyed it. Um, I didn't take any photographs, but my son used his iPhone and he got something like that, okay? So I thought it was, I was impressed, like I didn't, I didn't even try. Um, and he was able to get that with his iPhone. Fortunately, and I knew there would be, there were plenty others who got some really great pictures, uh, including our master image processor here at uh, Hubble, uh, Zolt LeVay. He was in Jackson Hole. Uh, there was an art exhibit of some of his pho photographs there. Uh, and he got pictures like that. Isn't that cool? So that is the corona and all the details and the striations of the solar wind blowing out away from the sun. Um, Zolt is an accomplished one. And this right here, he says, is the star Regulus. OK, yes. Okay, so um, you could see about, uh, I'd say 60 to 70% of the detail he shows here with the naked eye, which was really cool, okay? Because I, as a professional astronomer, had seen pictures like this and I'd never seen a total totality before and the amount, amount of detail and the striations I could see was surprised me. Uh, huh? They didn't move. Um, they, they were pretty much, 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 much stationary. Yes? That, that's Regulus. That's regular. I could see uh, about 10, 10 stars around the sky. It was just really cool. And, you know, we were at the, this was a festival in, in Rexburg. There were like 500 people, and they all started cheering and clapping and applauding when it hit totality. Um, I, they, most of them probably didn't know what to expect. Um, and it, it was just really cool to, to have the whole swell of everyone going, wow. And, you know, people were just spinning around going, oh, wow, this is crazy. For two minutes, so two minutes of, of, of craziness in Rexburg. Um, Zolt also got pictures of something called Bailey's Beads uh, and, and the prominences. Um, so actually, this is a really cool pic. You can see the prominence on the edge of the sun. And down here, you can start to see some a little bit of beading along up in here. Um, I couldn't see any red or any, any detail like that. I could see individual little dots just as you came in and out of, out of it, but it was very quick. Um, and, uh, and then, of course, you get the big diamond ring effect. All right, so I'll put together a montage from first into a little bit of a beating to totality and then pulling out. And this was what I remember most was that as it goes into totality, you have your glasses on and you don't take them off until it hits totality. And then you see um, the, the corona. But as it comes out, you're watching, you're going, I want to watch this as long as possible. And then it starts to bead, and then boom, you get that diamond ring, and you go, ah, oh, okay, glasses back on. <laughs> <laughs> and that was a lot of fun. Um, so that's really cool. Um, I think we got a lot of people in America 
to understand that a total solar eclipse is really interesting, which means that the traffic, which was horrible getting back to Salt Lake City this time, uh, will be even worse next time, which is only seven years away, April 8th, 2024. We get a four minute total solar eclipse passing. Uh, the peak is somewhere down here in Mexico. It goes through, uh, just goes passes Austin and San Antonio, uh, goes straight over Dallas, goes all the way up through the Northeast and goes out over, uh, over Canada. Do, so, do you remember what community is at the intersection of the- Carbondale, Carbondale Illinois. Carbondale. 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 C-A-R-B-O-N. Yeah, Carbondale, Illinois gets totality for both of those these eclipses, okay? It's the eclipse clap capital of the U.S. for the current <laughs> set, all right? Anyway, so uh, I hope, the, how, many of you, how many of you actually got out to see totality? All right, good, good. And did uh, the rest of you see partiality at least? <coughs> okay, okay, good. I, I expected my audiences here would have at least seen partiality. But if you, if you haven't seen totality, um, it really was more than I expected. Uh, even though I knew what to expect, it was a lot more. So try and get it. It's a, it's a very really good bucket list item. And you got a, nice, you got a relatively easy one. You can go to Cleveland, okay? I have a great vacation in Cleveland. Uh, if I make a bad joke about Cleveland, I have a friend at Case Western who will punish me for it. So I'm not going to make any jokes about Cleveland, okay? <laughs> All right. So that's my wrap up of the eclipse. There are some amazing photographs online and videos and such. And I encourage you to check out and uh, see all that other professional stuff. All right. Uh, there is another major event happening, and that's this month in, uh, in September, is the Cassini Climax. Cassini was launched 20 years ago, almost 20 years ago, October 1997 it was launched. And it will be crashing into Saturn on September 15th, 2017, and they estimate signal loss will occur about 7.54 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time. <laughs> well, the point is, is that they want to make sure that they don't contaminate anything, okay? All right, you know, if they, they, if they let it float, there's a tiny, tiny chance it might hit Enceladus, and if there's any prebiotic life on Enceladus, we don't want to contaminate it or anything. So, like we did with other ones, we're going to smash it. We're going to crash it into the planet, and we're going to learn about the uh, de the details of the atmosphere of the planet as it goes in. Because, as for the last three or four hours, as it goes in, it will be doing a real time data stream. And I looked it up. To that real time data stream will be twenty seven kilobits per second. <laughs> that is the speed of a twenty eight eight modem. That, that was, was first sold in, in 1994. Yes. <laughs> right. So Cassini will literally be on the internet phoning home with its, uh, its final data. All right, I'm not going to say too much anything more about Cassini because Bonnie Meinke will give you the full scoop of this next month. But uh, this is um, this this will be a fun event, and NASA is publicizing it. Though. You'll see all sorts of cool stuff about it over over the month. See a little bit, and Bonnie will explain to you what it all means next month. All right, finally, I have to give you at least one science story here tonight, um, and it's called Into the Stratosphere, Exoplanet Edition. Now, Earth's atmosphere is segmented, okay? Uh, we live and, and, and do almost everything down here in the bottom layer of the atmosphere called the troposphere. And in the troposphere, this is a, this is a graph of temperature versus altitude. Temperature goes down in the troposphere, okay? As you go higher, it gets colder, right? Mm -hmm. But at a certain point, it actually turns over and starts to get warmer, and that is the layer of the atmosphere called the stratosphere. The point is, is we're trapping, the greenhouse gases are trapping heat down here in the troposphere, um, but it's being heated by UV light um, in the stratosphere, okay? Um, and then it turns over again into the mesosphere, it turns over again into the thermosphere, and really you're up at the, what we consider the top of the atmosphere, and everything else out here is the exosphere, which is of course where Hubble and the Space Shuttle and the International Space Station are, okay? So the point is, is that we understand Earth's atmosphere and it's got these temperature inversions. What we would want to know is are such temperature inversions characteristic of planets around other stars? We see this temperature inversion here. What happens on other stars? Well, um, Hubble 
has a, um, a, a spectrum of a planet called WASP-121b, okay? Um, and in looking at that, they're trying to determine, does it have a stratosphere? Is the, are the outer layers warmer than the inner layers? If the outer layers are cooler, then they will actually absorb light from the lower layers, whereas if the outer layers are warmer, then they will emit light, okay? So you've got two graphs here. This is purple. This is the spectrum for a brown dwarf that shows it in absorption, okay? So the outer layers of the brown dwarf are cooler. They absorb in the, the water bands here in the infrared, whereas Hubble spectrum actually shows emission at those same band passes in the infrared. This is what they tell me, the strongest evidence so far that they have seen a stratosphere on a planet around another star. And this is the kind of cool thing we can look forward to over the next couple of decades. We can check to whether or not the things that happen in our solar system also happen in other solar systems. Is our solar system somehow special? We hope not because we based a lot of our science, uh, scientific projections about the universe on, on our solar system. But this is the kind of thing that shows us that, okay, yeah, stratospheres also exist on extrasolar planets. That's kind of cool, isn't it? Uh, so, of course, a squiggly line is, uh, for, the, for the spectrum is not suitable for a press release. So, of course, they had to come up with a cool artist's illustration. Um, and so this is the star WASP-121. Um, and this is the planet WASP-21b. Uh, because it's so hot, it's actually, its outer atmosphere um, is at around 4,000 degrees, they say. Um, they believe that the, um, uh, the, some, of the, some of the molecules are actually uh, e being evaporated from the planet and blown, might be blown off in a wind. Um, but it's very hot on its near side, it's tightly locked, and it's actually slightly egg-shaped because it is filling up about, uh, what they said, about 60% of its Roche lobe. All right, and the Roche lobe is the uh, radius at which it actually becomes totally descend distended and material can flow away freely. Okay, by gravitation. So uh, this is the gravitation. This is this is the pretty artist conception that they had our artists make to show it off. All right. That's yes. Question. Define brown dwarf, please. Brown dwarf. Thank you. I did use jargon. I forgot to mention a brown dwarf is an object that's between a planet and a star. Okay. Um, um, a star, star is powered by uh, a main sequence star is powered by hydrogen fusion in its core. A brown dwarf reaches deuterium fusion, but never gets big, it's not big enough to reach hydrogen fusion, okay? A planet like Jupiter never reaches deuterium fusion, doesn't reach any fusion whatsoever. So the ones that make this tiny bit of fusion and then fade away, uh, those are brown dwarfs. So they're like uh, 70 Jupiter masses and above, um, okay? All right, good question. Thanks you for catching me on that. All right. And now we go to our featured speaker. Um, and our speaker tonight is a senior scientist here. And um, I guess that he'd been here about 30 years. And he said, no, he'd been here 34 years. Uh, and then he said, you know what? I was actually here five years before that, helping write the proposal that created this institute, okay? This is a guy who's got so much history. He was here at the genesis of the ideas that created this building, okay? And I gotta say, you know, this institute is, was a totally new thing in astronomy at the time because most of the observatories were supported by staff in an astronomy department at some university. This was an association of universities running a specific institute to just do professional support of the telescope um, and it's turned out fantastically. Uh, their vision has been executed incredibly well over the last 30 years. Um, and uh, let's see, his official status is as senior astronomer and uh, it, uh, so major primary support for the Space Telescope Imaging Spectrograph. All right, so user support for that, okay? So ladies and gentlemen, let's have a warm uh, welcome for Dr. Nolan Walburn.
So that's all. Thank you. Well, uh, Frank's various introductions here uh, actually caused me to add uh, a few preliminary uh, additional introductory remarks that I wasn't going to. Uh, first about the Aura Association of Universities for Research <coughs> in Astronomy. Uh, actually, it isn't true that this institute was the first place that operated this way. Aura uh, founded Kitt Peak in Arizona and Cerro Tololo in Chile. Uh, the 1950s and the 1960s, and these were the first visitor centers where anyone could come and observe based on competitive peer-reviewed proposals instead of just people who owned the telescopes. So Aura already had that uh, paradigm in mind when we proposed to NASA to manage this institute, <coughs> and uh, were successful against uh, many predictions since uh, Princeton had, uh, in some ways, first uh, dibs on it, but uh, I guess our proposal was better. Uh, and I was on the Cerro Tololo staff in Chile uh, when I came here and did that in uh, 1979, um, which also relates to uh, the uh, lift of it that was uh, uh, distributed and uh, also relates to my talk. So I thought I'd say a couple of words about that. This is uh, uh, probably most of you know is, is the first supernova uh, this close to the sun since the invention of the telescope. So uh, uh, that was 1610, by the way. So. We're pretty excited about that. And um, I'm going to be showing you some very peculiar, interesting, uh, massive stars, which are near the ends of their lifetimes and behaving very strangely. Uh, and we don't understand the details of why they're doing this. That's what we're working on. Uh, but uh, as you know, probably all massive stars end their lives as supernovae, uh, the final collapse and the explosion or maybe implosion in some very massive cases. Uh, and uh, yeah, we would expect them to do some strange things before that happens. Not this one. Uh, this uh, star is only 20 solar masses, although that's twice as massive as uh, the lowest masses that make supernovae. And the star was known as just a normal, ordinary blue supergiant in the LMC. No one paid much attention to it until one fine day, uh, February 23rd, 1987, it uh, blew up. And then it was too late to go back and study the details of the star that blew up. We very much wish we had done that. And, uh, but it did nothing exceptional to draw attention to itself until it exploded. And that was a big surprise. Uh, these stars will explode sometime soon. And they are drawing attention to themselves. So uh, this uh, lead uh, image here is the, <clears throat> the whole Large Magellanic Cloud, which uh, you may know is a a relatively small, well, moderate-sized satellite galaxy of our own that is very important to the study of uh, uh, many things because it is far enough away that we can see it as an independent galaxy. It has its own evolution and, and uh, heavy element content, uh, different from our galaxy. Uh, but yet it's near enough that with large ground-based telescopes and the Hubble Space Telescope, we can study individual stars in it. And so that's a very useful uh, bootstrap between what we can do in our galaxy and, and, and more distant galaxies where we don't have this uh, level of resolution and information content. So uh, uh, as I've already mentioned, we've been working on these uh, very peculiar variable stars. Uh, and I just published a paper. We just published a paper with my collaborators there, all of whom uh, happened to be from Argentina. Uh, I wasn't born there, but uh, I spent eight years there uh, when I was a child. And uh, the other three uh, are Argentines, although two of them uh, now work in Chile, uh, Las Campanas and uh, La Serena, uh, close to the big observatories uh, like Cerro Tololo and other ones because the climate in Chile is better than in Argentina <laughs> for astronomy. And so it's a hotbed of uh, major uh, international observatories, uh, uh, some under, still under construction. <clears throat> so this shows you the location of the three objects I'm going to be talking about tonight. Uh, the paper actually involves five, but uh, these are the three that we have the most information uh, about uh, in our study. And uh, so um, <clears throat> I'll start by showing a, um, a graph and a few images. But this talk, I'm going to show, show you mostly light curves, that is, uh, how the brightness of these stars change as a function of time, and spectra. Oh, no, not spectra. But I hope to convince at least some of you by the end of this talk that spectra are at least as beautiful, if not more beautiful, than images. Because um, <clears throat> they tell you so much more. You, that's, that's how we learn uh, the physics of the stars. Uh, 
is from their spectra. And uh, so I'm going to, uh, not going to assume, some of you maybe have some familiarity with spectroscopy, and, uh, um, <clears throat> uh, but I'm going to explain some for those who don't and uh, may be interested in that because uh, you can uh, learn a lot if uh, you bear with me and, uh, and uh, follow uh, some of the details that I'll show you. But we're starting off here with a graph, the only graph I think I have. Uh, it looks pretty complicated, and, uh, but don't worry about it. We're not going to talk about everything that's in here. You can begin by ignoring all the red and blue points. Throw them out. <laughs> Those are for something else. Uh, we're interested in this green uh, triangles and lines uh, there. But first, let me explain what the diagram is. Uh, this is a Hertzsprung-Russell diagram in particular a theoretical Hertzsprung-Russell diagram uh, aimed after two of the most outstanding astronomers of the 20th century who discovered it. And uh, they, they worked with observations first, uh, namely the uh, uh, brightnesses of the stars and their spectral types. This has now been converted to temperatures. These are tens of thousands of uh, degrees Kelvin um, from, uh, oops, now I did it. Um, from uh, <clears throat> 50,000 degrees, uh, the hottest stars, to uh, 10,000 degrees, so these, these are all hot stars. The sun is, is 6,000 degrees, so it's kind of even off this graph. So these are massive hot stars. Hot, uh, massive stars get hotter, and uh, uh, surprisingly enough, they have shorter lifetimes than uh, low-mass stars like the sun because despite the fact that they have more mass, the nuclear reactions are very sensitive to temperature. They have higher temperatures, and they burn up faster even though they have more material to burn. So uh, this uh, bold line here at the left is the main sequence. Uh, which is a very important discovery that uh, Hertzsprung and Russell did. And uh, if you plot up all the stars in the sky uh, that you can uh, with their parameters, 90% the of them lie along that line. And um, I didn't think I did it that time. Uh, why is that? Uh, well, uh, we now understand why that is. When people discovered this, they didn't. But we've made a lot of progress in, in the last uh, decades. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> so that is the locus of stars in this diagram of uh, luminosity increasing upwards, and temperature increasing leftwards, while they are burning hydrogen into helium. And that is 90% of the lifetime of any star. And uh, so they lie on this locus, and that's called the main sequence. And here it's labeled in mass, as you see, from 15 times the mass of the sun up to 60 times the mass of the sun. And some of the stars we're talking about are more massive than that. Uh, then, then you see uh, these lines drawn on here. Uh, these are evolutionary tracks. Uh, and uh, so that's what the stars do in this diagram when they start to run out of uh, hydrogen fuel and they begin to evolve, as we say. They follow these tracks uh, in, in the HR diagram. And we now understand a lot of why that is, uh, why they do that. Um, <clears throat> and uh, they, they take a certain uh, length of time to evolve, as we uh, say. And uh, these dashed lines here are called isochrones. And, and uh, you see they're labeled in millions of years. And so that tells you how far the star has moved away from the main sequence in that length of time. And as I said, the uh, more massive stars go faster. And you see that in uh, two or three million years, these stars up here at the top are all the way over here. But uh, here in uh, lower masses, uh, eight or 10 million years, they're just uh, um, <clears throat> still probably still burning some uh, hydrogen to helium because this glitch here in the tracks is where they really run out of hydrogen. <clears throat> well, um, so we're interested in these uh, green uh, triangles, which uh, some of which are single, uh, but some of which there are two of, joined by a, a dashed green line. And that is how these luminous blue variables behave in, in the HR diagram as they're undergoing outbursts. And so uh, these stars are so luminous uh, that um, they can't hold themselves together. A star is a, is a battle between gravity trying to collapse it. Uh, its fate is sealed as soon as a star forms. A star forms from a cloud of gas in uh, interstellar space that begins to contract and heat up, and it gets hotter and hotter until it reaches millions of degrees in, interior, in its interior, and that's where nuclear reactions begin. And so that produces a pressure outwards, and so a star is just a huge mass of gas in equilibrium between the gravity inwards and the pressure from the nuclear reactions outwards. And uh, as long as you can maintain that, you have a stable star. But as I already mentioned, it'll run out of fuel. It's burning fuel, and uh, the most of its lifetime is spent burning hydrogen, the simplest uh, atom, into helium, the, the next atom, the periodic table. 
Uh, but then it can go through subsequent stages where it gets even hotter and burns heavier elements into even heavier ones. And in fact, that's very important because uh, those nuclear reactions not only allow stars to exist, but they synthesize all the chemical elements in the universe, uh, heavier than hydrogen and helium, which come from the Big Bang, a little bit of lithium maybe. But everything we're made out of was made inside of stars. So the atoms in your body uh, were made inside of a star uh, or in the explosions. Uh, the heavier elements are uh, uh, really heavy elements, heavier than iron. Uh, many of them are made in the actual supernova explosions when these stars die. And that's blown out into you know, space and then new generations of stars can form out of that enriched material. And uh, the sun is at least a second or maybe a third generation star because uh, we could not exist with the uh, the uh, chemical composition of the uh, first stars is hydrogen and helium. You can't make molecules and, uh, and people out of that. Uh, so you need these heavier elements made in successive generations of stars in order to have uh, life and uh, everything else uh, we have here on the Earth. Well, getting back to our main story here now, these uh, um, massive stars, they, they get into trouble when they try to move over here. Uh, and, and they get more luminous and uh, and uh, um, their, their winds, the stars, even normal massive stars lose material all the time through stellar winds, but it's a, a steady uh, quiescent flow and, and that's okay. But here then they start to get unstable and they can't hold themselves together. So these stars has, have developed kind of a last ditch mechanism to extend their lifetimes, if you will, which we still don't understand in detail, in which they have these episodes of uh, enhanced uh, mass loss, and uh, they inflate, and they become cooler. You see them becoming cooler, uh, and uh, uh, <clears throat> but this is not the evolution, of the nuclear evolution of these tracks. This is a, a an event which takes place on the time scale of thousands of years or uh, hundreds, thousands of years, uh, and uh, can repeat. So the star gets here undergoes this instability, moves over here, and it moves back. And it can do that several times uh, with enhanced ejection of, of material. Uh, and uh, that's what a luminous blue variable is. It's an unstable, massive star near the end of its lifetime. This uh, dark line here is called the Humphreys-Davidson limit, uh, after two astronomers uh, who discovered it and uh, found that there are no stars over here. Uh, you go over and there are red stars uh, over here, but there's a limit that goes kind of like this and that. And uh, you look at the most luminous stars in external galaxies and there are no stars there. They don't make it there. They, they hit this instability limit and they do this. And then um, <clears throat> we thought then they, they uh, lost a lot of material and it became another kind of peculiar star called the wolf A star before exploding. But now, just within the last few years, we have evidence that some of these stars explode directly as luminous blue variables. So that's our hope, uh, that we'll see one do it. You know, our, our real block, block right now in understanding the end stages of massive stars is seeing a star that we know and studied well do it. <laughs> uh, well, first thing we see is a supernova explosion from this galaxy, and it's too late. You, you can't go back and see what kind of star did that. You can try to get some information, some inference, and maybe you have some old images of where it, it was there. But uh, we would like to see one of these stars that we have observed doing all sorts of things explode, and then we would know uh, things that we don't know. So uh, actually, two of the three stars I'm going to show you are in this diagram, R127. It's Radcliffe for South Africa, where they describe some of the stars. That are there. They're in the Magellanic Cloud, the large Magellanic Cloud, R127. It's been observed to have this huge excursion here from you know, 30,000 degrees down to 10,000 degrees and uh, back again, and R71. And uh, you don't want to believe the plot. That's this little line here. You don't want to believe that too much because uh, uh, it looks like it had lower luminosity, lower mass, but uh, and it's now an outburst. As we'll see, it's the brightest star in the large margin of that cloud right now. And I'll show you that. And it's moved up uh, as opposed to horizontally as, as these stars do. And so, you know, there's always new stuff to uh, discover and then try to understand in, in astronomy. So, um, now, uh, some of this is kind of technical and, and difficult, and I'm really trying to do my best to explain it without jargon, but if I don't succeed, uh, I welcome a question or, or a clarification as I'm talking. Any more extended discussion, let's save that for the end, because otherwise I won't get through it. But if I use a term or, or something or, or said something that isn't clear and you think can be clarified uh, with a few words, please do. Like, here's one. So you said that, that um, it's on the order of a thousand of years. Mm -hmm. 
some of them we have observed uh, varying. We haven't obviously observed many for thousands of years yet, but uh, they have uh, both outbursts and eruptions. And uh, I'm going to be talking about outbursts mainly, which are these uh, things that last decades maybe, and we have observed uh, the full cycle for uh, one we had, and uh, I'm going to show you for the first time, most uh, people didn't see it the last month when my paper came out, the second one, which is observed over the full range of outbursts. Uh, but uh, then they more infrequently have giant eruptions in which they uh, eject uh, much more and denser material and then create circumstellar nebulae. And uh, <clears throat> we, uh, we've observed uh, some of those events probably, but more uh, than that, we can observe such events ejected thousands of years ago and, and for uh, how long ago from their velocities and sizes, how long ago they were ejected. And that's where that uh, thousands of years uh, uh, comment comes from. So that's a good question. What is yeah. the cause of the retrograde that I see in each one of those? Why does it go, go back? Because it goes up and it goes back and then it goes across. Every one of them is a little retrograde in each one of them. Oh, the, this little uh, glitch here? Yes. Uh, that's, that's the terminal age main sequence, and that's where um, really the helium, the hydrogen burning stops completely. And uh, so, you know, this again, this is a plot of uh, brightness versus temperature. So when stars get to that point, they, uh, they do a little retrograde, as that's a good word uh, for it, uh, a little glitch uh, in this diagram. And that's uh, as their interiors readjust, and then they, they cross, uh, especially these lower masses, uh, they cross this uh, pretty rapidly. And then they go over here and become red giants, red supergiants, where they then burn helium to carbon, and that, that can last 10% of the hydrogen burning lifetime, uh, uh, a million years for a, a star that lasts 10 million years. Uh, uh, and so this is part of the readjustment of the star's interior as, as it goes from losing its hydrogen source to gaining its helium source. But uh, and then it can go on and burn carbon and, and burn uh, uh, other various elements up to silicon, uh, the most massive stars, and that lasts three days. <laughs> so they run out of tricks, and then there's the final collapse because the, the energy goes away, but the gravity is always there. <clears throat> Good questions. Was there another one? There? Okay, well, let's move on. I'm not going to spend this much time on all of the <laughs> diagrams, I hope. So uh, first uh, object we're going to observe is R127, which you heard about and saw that's located near 30 Uratus. Uh, those of you who've been here a lot before and heard some of my previous talks, uh, uh, are familiar with 30 Doradus. This is a 30 Doradus region, actually. The 30 Doradus nebula is half off the screen here. <laughs> it's up here uh, because that's not what we're talking about today. This is a site of uh, formation of the most massive stars known at the present time, up to 300 solar masses. We didn't know until very recently that there can be stars that massive. But you see all these different kinds of structures here, some with nebulosity, some without. Uh, these are all massive stars. They have different masses and ages evolving, doing their thing. Uh, in this large region, and, and if we understood uh, why every star is where it is, and, and these nebulosities, some of which are ejected and some of which are just fluorescing, we would know a lot more than we do today, and someday we will. This is what we study. And in particular, we study R127, which I can uh, haven't marked, but I can point out to you in this. Uh, uh, oh, uh, supernova 1987A, by the way, is right there. Oh, and, and I forgot uh, another thing I was going to mention. You see in, the, in your diagram here, uh, the supernova 87A is, is inside that ring, the famous ring. Then there are two stars beside it. Those are called stars 2 and 3. And, and the, the original star that exploded is star 1. And it was originally three magnitudes brighter than those other two stars. Uh, it was 12th magnitude, and those two were 15th. That's a factor of 16 in brightness. So you can believe it's not there anymore, right? <laughs> what we see there in the middle is just the, the blast uh, wave from the explosion coming out, but that star is gone. So uh, we know that. But there was initially some confusion about uh, which star had exploded and how many stars there were there. And uh, I actually discovered star three, uh, uh, the, one, the fainter one down here, just as a bulge on the overexposed image of, of the star that exploded in pre-explosion images I had of 30 Doradus um, from back when I was on the Saratoga staff. <coughs> uh, and I got some credit for <coughs> Uh, there was a telegram came out saying, oh, that the, the star hadn't exploded because there were till, still two stars there. <laughs> yes, there's still two stars there, but not that one. <clears throat> so uh, here, uh, this is a fantastic region. As it, it contains 87A, uh, which is, um, as I said, uh, right there in that little group. And uh, here, 
See this little group of stars here? I want you to see two bright stars and then two fainter ones up at an angle there, okay? And uh, the, the one here, the, the bright star, the brighter star to the right is R127. And uh, that's a star I'll be showing you uh, some bizarre current behavior of. Uh, and, uh, <clears throat> but that's where it lies. You see, it's in an evolved region, OK? Uh, the, the youngest regions have all gas and dust. Here, these stars have evolved, and they've blown it all away. It looks like you know, almost like a ring of, of stars here. Uh, and, and you can just tell by looking that these are older stars than the ones in 30 Uranus because they, they've blown away all the, the gas and dust that they had around them uh, after they formed. <clears throat> But uh, this is a low resolution, large field thing, which, uh, image, which is useful to have. But uh, we want to know more. We want higher resolution and, uh, and more detail. And uh, so here are those same stars I just showed you in a, in a higher resolution image. Uh, now what looked like the two brighter stars are actually uh, these two clusters. They weren't single stars, and that's a big problem, even at the large cloud, which is the nearest neighbor. Uh, is this really a single star, or is this two or more stars so close together that we can't resolve them. And so we're always looking for higher resolution to answer that question. So um, you can see, so these are kind of uh, quiescent blue stars uh, in these clusters, some brighter ones, some fainter ones. And, but here is R127 itself, surrounded by this red halo. And uh, I didn't put that there. It's there, uh, drawing attention to itself. And uh, uh, actually, uh, when it had its major outburst, which I also helped discover in, in 1980, it became much brighter than this star. I, I went down to Saratoga to observe after I left the staff, and I went to the field, and I sat there for a while <laughs> until I figured out what was going on, it's because the field was completely different from what it had been the last time I looked at it, and it's because uh, this star, which had been the brightest, was no longer the brightest, and this one was way brighter uh, by several magnitudes. Uh, what this red glow is, this is an example of one of these circumstellar uh, uh, shells that was ejected a few thousand years ago, maybe. And it is glowing in the light of a nebular emission lines of hydrogen alpha, but also especially nitrogen, uh, which are two strong lines uh, on either side of H alpha. And uh, this, uh, these stars, these massive stars, they, they undergo nuclear reactions. Uh, you know, I can't give you all detail of massive stellar evolution in the time I have, but uh, massive stars burn helium to hydrogen on what's hydrogen to helium on what's called the CNO cycle. It's a series of reactions which very rapidly lock up all of the carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen in nitrogen because that's the slowest reaction. It's a bottleneck. Now, if this material gets mixed up to the surface of the star or ejected before the reaction go to completion, you can see that. And so you can actually see the nuclear reaction products of a given star on its own surface. Isn't that amazing? And uh, that tells you, of course, enormous amount about what the star is doing, how it's evolving, and uh, uh, yes? Uh, how far away from the other star from the cluster is R127? Maybe just the other star right next to it. Uh, I know we can't really see the depth there, but... Yeah, uh, uh, a few, a few uh, parsecs. I, I happen to know that the... Uh, now this is a, actually, I said it's high resolution image, and it is higher uh, than the previous one, but it's kind of low, actually. There's structure in what we can see in even higher resolutions within this nebulosity. I was just reading about it. And uh, so the, uh, the, the size of this nebula around the uh, star is about two parsecs, which is uh, six light years. So that gives you an idea of the scale. Uh, so these stars are a few light years away from each other, uh, but still within a compact cluster. Uh, and uh, this uh, nebula that R127 ejected has expanded to uh, engulf that star, or maybe it looks pretty blue to me. Uh, maybe it's in front of the, uh, the nebula. Um, you can tell this isn't a great image, too, because the star images are all kind of fuzzy. We don't like that. That's bad seeing introduced by the Earth's atmosphere. So this is an excellent observatory in Chile where they have very good seeing some nights, but not on this particular one. Yes? Sure, yes, uh, that's a huge subject, uh, the binary stars. And uh, so, uh, in fact, most stars, are, especially massive stars, are binaries or, or higher multiples. And uh, so instead of a single star, like uh, we have in the sun with planets going around it, you have two stars uh, going around each other or around their center of mass. 
and uh, massive stars like to be binaries, and uh, this tremendously complicates in the study of their evolution because when they start to evolve and expand, then they interact, and uh, and one star might dump material on the other one, uh, and uh, all kinds of bad things can happen. Um, or good things, <laughs> you look at it, but it makes the study of stereo evolution a lot harder. <clears throat> okay, well, uh, let's go on here now uh, and um, uh, see. Uh, so I'm not going to show you any more images. Now we're going to see what these stars, uh, uh, these new three luminous blue variables are doing right now. Um, so first, this is our first light curve for R127. Uh, see the star names are up at the top there. And uh, so uh, the year is up at the top, the bottom is Julian days, and uh, you can't remember what those mean, uh, but they're useful. But you can see then that this uh, sequence of measures, individual measures of the brightness on different dates, goes from just before 2008 to uh, uh, just uh, this, year, this year. Uh, um, <clears throat> or we have 2017 for some stars, I don't know if we have for this one. So. Uh, this, this is amazing, and it was a little bit embarrassing because uh, uh, we wrote a paper in 2008 about the giant outburst of R127, which, as I said, was discovered in 1980. We studied it uh, you know, for almost 30 years, and, and then it came down, 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 down. These are points from our previous paper, published in 2008. And so the title of the paper was The End of a three-decade outburst of R127. <laughs> Before the paper even appeared in press, <laughs> went back up again. <laughs> and uh, that's what they do. We don't understand them. We don't understand why they do this. And now, as opposed to this sort of 30-year outburst with fluctuations and everything, which I'm not showing you because I can't show you everything I have, uh, now it's had like four uh, of these undulations with time scales of two or three years. Why is it doing that? What does it mean? Is this reverberation or a reaction to what happened before, or, or is this become, going to become a supernova and uh, give us the delight that uh, we would hope it's falling apart completely and uh, will explode. Um, <clears throat> so uh, that's what it's doing, and unfortunately I can't explain to you why or how, um, but there are obviously some instabilities uh, inside the star related to the ending of the nuclear reactions and, and these uh, LBB uh, excursions, and that's what it's doing. Now these marks down below are uh, epochs at which we have spectra, uh, both high resolution and low resolution spectra. And uh, that's what I'll show you next and uh, try to explain a little. So the upper ones are high resolution spectra and, and the bottom are low resolution. So first I have here a montage of, um, um, yeah, th these are V magnitudes here. So uh, a magnitude, as you may know, is a factor of 2.5. Uh, five magnitudes is a factor of 100 in brightness. So, so this thing uh, ranged over two magnitudes uh, uh, during this, period, although it was brighter than that. It was ninth magnitude up at the top of the uh, 1990 uh, maximum. Well, here is a sequence of spectra, which uh, Frank has kindly uh, made uh, brighter, so uh, um, we can see the labels a little better. And I want to spend a little time explaining them, because I'm sure most of you are not familiar with uh, uh, astronomical spectra, maybe not any spectra, and, uh, and we have a certain notation. So the first thing you see is all these lines, right? Uh, most of them going upwards. Those are called emission lines. Uh, actually, that was useful. Uh, we had an introduction here about a planet in which uh, uh, cooler material produces absorption and, and hotter material produces emission. Same thing is going on here. And so uh, there are a few absorptions you can see. We'll see in some more spectra later, which, which are dominated by absorption. But uh, these are each one of those lines is a transition of electrons in an atom. Now, most of you probably know that um, matter is, is made up of atoms, the, the chemical elements, and, uh, and they have nuclei with protons and neutrons. The protons have positive charge, and then in the neutral state, they have an equal number uh, of electrons to protons with negative charges surrounding the nucleus. So they're electrically neutral. Um, the, the electrons are negative and the protons are positive. But uh, <clears throat> A uh, very interesting, important thing is if you increase the temperature or, or, or decrease the pressure of the gas containing this material, uh, these uh, uh, atoms can be ionized and lose an electron or two electrons or more, uh, depending on how many they have. Uh, of course, hydrogen only has one to lose, but helium has two. And when that happens, then we call that an ion, not an atom anymore. 
And furthermore, its spectrum is completely different. All the lines which it produced uh, as an atom are, are gone, and a whole new set of lines is produced uh, by this ion because the electronic states are changed um, by the fact that there's one fewer electron uh, there. And uh, so uh, if you get transitions, uh, these electrons can be in different states. Uh, they, they have their, their sort of uh, lowest states, but then they can get excited up to higher ones. And uh, if uh, uh, an atom or an ion absorbs a photon, uh, an electron can move up to a higher state. But then it can move down and emit a photon. And so uh, electrons moving down create emission lines, and uh, electron uh, being absorbing photons uh, produce absorption. So we have a, a continuum here for each spectrum. These, uh, I should say, uh, are the spectra of the same star, <laughs> believe it or not. Uh, taken at those dates, which uh, you, know, you can read from the back, go from uh, 2008, did it say 2008 or did it say 2008 to uh, 2016? And uh, all these uh, huge variations that you see occurred during those uh, eight years. And um, um, <clears throat> so uh, here at the bottom, um, the star was in a hot state. And uh, so here you see these notations, which are combinations of letters, which are the uh, chemical element. Fe is iron, Si is silicon, He is helium, uh, N is nitrogen, followed by a Roman numeral. And the Roman numeral astronomers use to denote the ionic state. How many electrons has it lost? So uh, if it were neutral, uh, it would be uh, Roman numeral one. You don't see many ones. Well, you see some helium one, okay? This is neutral helium. But uh, this is ionized nitrogen. This is uh, doubly ionized iron, uh, doubly ionized silicon. Uh, and so these are identifications of these features in the spectrum. In fact, here you see this, this is mainly an absorption, although it has a little bit of emission on the red edges, silicon absorption triplet. Uh, and then you see this uh, nice uh, multiplet here of nitrogen emission lines. Uh, and uh, so this tells you right away uh, by studying the lines and especially the ratios of lines from successive ions what the temperature and the pressure of the gas of this atmosphere or envelope producing them is. And, so, and you learn the chemical composition, uh, you learn all sorts of details about the physics of, of the atmosphere or, or the plasma that these lines are in. And uh, as an added bonus, you get the radial velocity because the positions of the lines, which are in principle fixed by the structure of the atom, but if, if there's a motion along the line of sight between the source and you, then they move uh, in wavelength, and you can measure that too. So isn't that amazing? We can get all of that information. And, and you know, these, these stars are, are completely unresolved. They're points. I showed you that the, the ejected nebula of R127 is resolved, and we can study some spatial structure in that. But all this information about uh, the, uh, the detail, physical details of the star itself come from the spectrum because uh, they're so far away that they're, they're just mathematical points. You can't get any structural information uh, from images. So uh, then uh, I think you understand the basics. I hope you do. Uh, any questions or uh, doubts about what I just tried to briefly explain? This is a, you know, a semester course in uh, 15 minutes, <laughs> but uh, I think you can capture the, the main points. and. Uh, uh, so see how it changes. These nitrogen lines here, which correspond to maybe a temperature of 20, 30,000 degrees, weaker, disappear, gone, no longer there. Now here are all these other lines over here. These are magnesium-2, iron-2 lines, cooler, from a cooler atmosphere. So this star has cooled. I, I mean, the, uh, it's expanded and it's cooled, and uh, uh, the visual magnitude has gotten brighter. And, uh, <clears throat> and then now... If by the end of the sequence, it's coming back. See here, there are the nitrogen uh, two lines again showing up. So over these eight years, we've, we've observed this star or this uh, LBV in outburst to uh, go from a hotter state to a cooler one and then back to a hotter one. So that's what we're doing here. Uh, I can't tell you why, but first you have to know that it does this, right? <laughs> if you didn't even know this, you're never going to figure out why. Uh, sometimes, sometimes we have an argument with theoreticians who don't like all these observational details, but they like to explain things. And it's true, the only way you can explain things is by physics. But you can't explain something you don't know. <laughs> First, you have to discover uh, what happens and then explain it. <laughs>
usually. <clears throat> okay, well, uh, onward. Now here, uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on these because it's too much and there isn't time, but uh, um, these are some panels from high resolution spectrograms. They're, they're much more extended. In fact, they're taken with the shells, which uh, uh, use multiple orders and, and, uh, and make a two-dimensional format, because uh, otherwise the thing would be a mile long uh, if it were uh, a single spectrum like those low resolution ones I showed you. And uh, <clears throat> so uh, the, the neat thing about these figures, which uh, my colleague uh, Roberto Gaman made, is that uh, what you have along the left edge of each of them is the light curve plotted vertically, okay? <laughs> so left is brighter and, and right is cooler. And then you can look at the spectra and see how it changes uh, as the temperature changes. And uh, so uh, here are these nitrogen lines that I was showing you, and uh, you see them in a lot more detail. They have what we call a composite p signy profile that that's combines a, a red-shifted uh, emission and a blue-shifted absorption, and that's a signature of an expanding atmosphere, by the way, or wind. And um, here they are, you know, when the thing was faint, 2008, now it starts to get brighter, they're gone. And uh, um, then, uh, as I told you, it's uh, gotten fainter again, and they're back. Helium-1 is, even, uh, more, is uh, even more sensitive. You see, it's, uh, it's um, um, strongest when, uh, when the star is hottest and faintest and uh, goes away and comes back. It's a very strong helium, uh, uh, neutral helium line here that uh, does that over this sequence. Here you see uh, sodium one, uh, but uh, those are not in the star. Those are interstellar lines, very narrow, very sharp lines of very low ionization in gas in space between the star and us. It forms interstellar lines. Okay, uh, that's the R127 story that I have. Let's move on to the second object, which is, uh, you know, they have strong similarities, and that's the, the, the bottom line of this talk, is the strong similarities between the behaviors of these objects at different epochs and among different objects at uh, comparable epochs. But, uh, and then you look in detail, and they all do different things. And uh, uh, look at the dates along the top of this uh, plot. Does that amaze you? <laughs> so uh, this is another thing we discovered in the course of this work. Uh, Harvard University has run uh, uh, these stars, of course, in large matter in the southern hemisphere. You can't see them from here. You have to go to South America or South Africa. And uh, they had telescopes down there from the late 19th century uh, monitoring the stars and then taking spectra. And uh, recently they digitized these data and put them online. And we looked, and lo and behold, R71, which was discovered as an LBV in 1970, you see this gap here, where there's nothing, where Harvard stopped, and uh, no one was doing anything until it was discovered to be an LBV, and had these two huge maxima, uh, right in 1914 and uh, 1939. Maybe you recognize those years. So uh, let's hope that this even bigger one here in uh, 2016, 2017 doesn't follow the same trend. Uh, but, but anyway, this star has been having these massive outbursts uh, during the whole 20th century. We had no clue until we plotted up these uh, Harvard uh, patrol data. And, um, and now it's uh, doing this. Uh, it had this uh, outburst here, uh, centered around 1970s. And now, right now, as I said earlier on, it's the brightest star in the uh, large Magellanic Cloud, brighter than ninth magnitude. And uh, let's look at... Uh, an expansion of that right-hand side there in the next side. So this just blows up the last few years so you can see uh, what it's uh, doing. And so it was down here and then had this huge rise. And now it's kind of flat, just sitting up there, although you can see uh, it's like kind of a periodic variation there. We're working on that, that, that may be some kind of pulsation or something that, that will tell us more about uh, what the star is doing up at this maximum. Um, but uh, it looks like about 440 days, as best you can tell uh, from that uh, information. And so now, that's where it is right now, as far as last check, uh, uh, early 2017. And uh, um, <clears throat> so we have spectra uh, at the epochs shown below. And this is the most boring slide I'll show you, um, <clears throat> which um, just almost constant 
absorption line spectrum. Very boring. Uh, but um, you see the years there, and uh, look, at, look at the previous one, uh, 2010 to 2016. And so this is what its spectrum looks like as it's just sitting up there on that flat, long, broad plateau uh, at its maximum. And these are absorption lines cool uh, of a cool atmosphere, iron-2, uh, uh, most of the iron-2 I have identified here, uh, calcium-2. Um, <clears throat> and the hydrogen lines are, even in the sun, we still see hydrogen lines uh, because hydrogen is the most abundant element, and so uh, it forms over a large range of temperatures. So not too much interesting to uh, see there in terms of variations, but uh, of course it's important to know <laughs> what it's doing and how it relates to the light curve. Uh, here uh, are some high resolution uh, observations of this star, um, <clears throat> which go back further than our monitoring. We get these from archives, at the, like the European Southern Observatory, back when it was uh, fainter and uh, hotter. And so you can see how the spectrum changes, uh, just like uh, <clears throat> the um, um, R127 uh, from uh, hotter species uh, down at the bottom up to these cooler ones that, that aren't identified here, but were in the, in the uh, spectra you saw of iron. Uh, two. Um, here's a sort of uh, curious detail. Uh, if, if you're curious about spectroscopic details, remember I told you these sodium one lines are uh, very narrow. That's characteristic of interstellar lines, and they're too low ionization for these hot stellar atmospheres. So that form there. But now look what happens. They get strong and broad. That's because they're now stellar features. The star has gotten so cool that it can form sodium, neutral sodium lines in its own atmosphere. And so the interstellar lines you can see here uh, are obliterated by the, uh, by the star itself. Uh, actually, it's even more interesting than that. This is a doublet, there are two lines. So you see two narrow ones and two broad ones, okay? The two narrow ones are formed in our galaxy, in the halo of our galaxy. The two broad ones are formed in the large magnetic cloud, which has a radial velocity shift relative to the galaxy. So you can see that the stellar uh, sodium lines are shifted, uh, red shifted, uh, to the velocity that star has in the large magnetic cloud, whereas the, the galactic interstellar lines are, of course, unaffected by what this star is doing 170,000 light years away. <clears throat> All sorts of neat things in spectra. And finally, I have one more star to show you, uh, and very pleased with this one because we have made that important discovery, uh, which uh, makes it a second R127. It's its name up there from the Henry Draper Extension Catalog, 269582. It's an LBV. It was not really confirmed uh, as an LBV uh, before our work uh, because there weren't enough data. Uh, you see big gaps there with no data. No one was interested in this star, but fortunately, some people had observed it. And you see a 12th magnitude, very faint. And that is the magnitude that R127 had. You know, I forgot to mention, I studied R127 when I was on Cerro Tolo's staff in the, in the uh, 1970s. And I discovered it as a very peculiar emission line object with uh, uh, similar to a very small number of stars, a very rare, and, and I discussed that group of stars. And, and then in 1980, it became an LBV. And then that was the first that we knew <laughs> that uh, this particular class of peculiar emission line stars is really a quiescent state of LBVs. And uh, again, I contributed to that. So this star was being observed here in uh, the early 1990s, and it was 12th magnitude, and uh, it had a spectrum like R127 had before. And then it did the same thing that R127 did, and now it's, it uh, hasn't gone as bright yet as R127, but maybe it will. Uh, R127 had a bunch of glitches before it got up to the top, and it has started going back up again. And so this is a light curve of this star. Uh, uh, from 1990 to 2016, and of course we have the spectra. And uh, this is maybe my favorite spectroscopic. Uh, this one is interesting. Uh, the previous one was boring, but uh, you see here the first one, which is from 1994, taken by British astronomer, uh, uh, two British astronomers, one of whom is here, Linda Smith and uh, Paul Crowther. Um, and here you see not nitrogen-2 as you do here. Remember we saw that? And then that's like 20,000 degrees. But nitrogen-3, it's a little bit blurred here, uh, but this is doubly ionized nitrogen, these two strong lines. And 
an ionized, uh, doubly ionized helium, um, sorry, uh, uh, helium-2. So uh, this means this star at this epoch was much hotter than it was here. And uh, this is what we call, I call an OFP slash W9 star, and it is the discovery that this star had that state right back when it had the faint magnitude. 12th magnitude, remember? And now it got cooler. It, it got uh, as cool as R127 was at the beginning of the sequence I showed you. And now look at this whole forest here of iron two lines, A-type spectrum. Very, very cool, 10,000 degrees. So it's gone from 30,000 degrees, 20,000, 10,000. And now it's started back again. Um, and uh, uh, getting hotter. It, it's, uh, you can sort of, well, not quite. The nitrogen lines aren't showing up too well yet. It's on the way. Or at least it's headed in that direction. So we have shown for the first time that this star is another bona fide LBV, which has now been observed all the way from its minimum state, 12th magnitude and, and a late O type spectrum, uh, to A type spectrum uh, near maximum. Uh, and um, uh, that's one of the neatest things in this paper, um, because that was not previously known. Here you see what we have in the light curve. And you, again, you see the same effects that, uh, uh, unfortunately, there, there was almost no uh, no photometry here, but we showed that it was faint uh, back before this in the 1990s. And now it's bright, and these are all iron two A-type lines. This is a forest of lines you saw before in the, in the lower resolution. And now it's started to get hotter again, and, uh, and these lines have weakened, and some higher ionization lines are appearing. Same thing, uh, same story, same lines. Here, here you see the nitrogen two lines in this wavelength range uh, very clearly uh, there disappear completely, replaced by iron two lines, and uh, then uh, coming back toward, you see the helium, here you see in the helium how it was strong, disappeared. Uh, this is an iron line, and coming back now uh, as it gets hotter again. Similarly over there. So uh, that's what these stars do. Someday we'll understand why. And this is uh, the final, uh, final plot here. Uh, <clears throat> putting all of these stars and a couple other ones, uh, two of which are in the paper and one of which isn't even in the paper, Estoratus, uh, on the same diagram of uh, brightness versus spectral type, OBAFG. The sun is a G star. Uh, the hottest stars are O stars, and BAF are intermediates. And so the point is this, is to show that you plot all these stars in this diagram and they all do the same thing. They, uh, they, they, there's this correlation between their brightness in these outbursts and their temperatures or spectral types. And that is a uh, very important clue to what is happening, the physical mechanism that we don't understand, and this is what has to be explained. Uh, how and why did I do this? So uh, actually my, one of my co-authors made this file. Uh, this is the last uh, slide, and he, he kindly quoted uh, some of my prose uh, in, the, in this slide, which is uh, really the... Uh, so the main point and conclusion of, of this whole study. <clears throat> Thank you. Okay, so questions. Do we have any questions from the audience here? Yes, in the back there. Uh, your last chart shows that uh, as they get cooler, they get brighter. Is that, is, that be, is that because they're getting larger? Yes, they get brighter in visual magnitude, but not in, uh, in, their, in, in the very first slide. Uh, can you go back to the first one on this, or you just have to flip back? Uh, that's a good point, and that's a crucial point. They get brighter in visual light because the ultraviolet uh, energy is being reprocessed by this expanding cooler envelope to lower temperatures. But uh, what the chart I showed, uh, the graph in the very first slide, shows is that their bolometric luminosities, which is the sum of all wavelengths, all energy being emitted by the nuclear reaction, doesn't change. See, the, those excursion lines are flat. Right. Doesn't it? <laughs> so, uh, the, the, you know, and again, that's a clue that this is not the energy generation that is changing. It's not the evolution. It, it's some uh, structural instability inside the star which is causing these uh, 
expansions and, and whatever readjustments inside the star, and the energy generation just goes on the same as it was, but uh, the visual magnitude, uh, which is, uh, becomes enhanced at these cooler phases, and that's what I've been showing you in the light curves and in this final diagram. So that's a very important point. Thank you. Right. Yeah, we actually had a, a little bit of that discussion online, just uh, clarifying that you know as the as as, as they get uh, brighter, they're actually getting cooler, and it's due to the swelling, uh, the expansion and contraction of the star. Yeah, and then a reprocessing of the hotter radiation to lower temperatures, but, but the the total amount of energy emitted by the star is not changing. Right. Uh, one person wanted to know if it had anything to do with solar flares. I, I said I didn't think there was any, any real connection with flares. Well, since we don't know what this is due to, <laughs> okay. you know, as we to say no, but no, the sun is a cool star, and the physics of cool stars is very different. Uh, it's uh, dominated by magnetic fields, and uh, um, so uh, you know, maybe these stars have some kind of flares uh, or something. But certainly, some of these ejections are uh, of uh, sort of stellar nebulae are not spherically symmetric. They have preferred axes and directions. So there's lots of peculiar physics, but most likely, it's you know it's not out of the question. Magnetic fields are involved in some way too in some of that, but it's it's different physics from what you have in cool stars. Okay. And the green shirt back there. Can the stars pick up additional material either from a neighboring star or from interstellar space? All right, so let me repeat that for the online audience. Can stars pick up material from neighboring stars? Or interstellar space? Or very, very neighboring stars, namely binary companions, as we mentioned over here. Uh, when you have two stars that are very close together, uh, uh, you know, some of these stars are two massive stars closer than the sun is to the Earth uh, to each other. And when they start to evolve and expand, they, uh, uh, the, the one that's expanding may dump huge amounts of material into the other star and actually invert the mass ratio such that the original star, which is lower mass and therefore hadn't evolved yet, becomes the more massive star. And, uh, and then it, it gets its lifetime extended maybe uh, and, uh, and goes through a different evolution than it would have if it had been by itself and, and just evolved at the start of its initial mass. So would that change the temperature uh, that uh, uh, can be it's probably a pretty traumatic, dramatic event. You know, we see stars that appear to be exploding or whatever, but they're not supernovae. And uh, those, some of those may be mass transfer events, uh, sudden mass transfer events, where a lot of material gets dumped on the other star. But at least in some cases, then they can settle down, and then they carry on their new evolution and their new lifetime uh, with different uh, masses. Uh, okay, blue shirt, yeah. This, uh Variable stars have been studied for decades and decades. <coughs> Has any of that study produced an understanding of the mechanism of the variation? And is that similar to, or does that have any application to what's happening in the blue variables? Okay, so the question was, variable stars have been studied for decades. Uh, does that indicate what the mechanism that's underneath this variability? Well, of course, there are many different kinds of variable stars, as you probably know. and so. Uh, um, and they have different causes. Uh, one of the neatest ones is eclipsing binaries. Uh, these two stars going around each other, if they align just right, uh, will eclipse each other. And uh, then you can determine the period uh, very accurately. And, and that's a whole industry studying eclipsing binary stars, uh, category of variable stars. Some of the most famous variable stars are pulsating variable stars. Uh, and there's instability strips in the HR diagram, which are not shown here. Uh, this mostly affects uh, lower mass stars at cooler temperatures than shown here. And when they try to evolve through these strips, um, they become unstable to pulsations. And, and so uh, they start expanding and contracting periodically uh, on the time scales of days, uh, from a few days to tens of days. And uh, the most famous of those are Cepheids, and uh, they turn out to be extremely useful because they were discovered early on and it was discovered that their period is related to their luminosity. And so uh, you can measure the period very easily and, uh, and then the apparent luminosity. And then from that, you can derive the uh, absolute luminosity and how far away they are. And this is one of the main ways of determining distances to uh, external galaxies is uh, through the pulsation, the periodic pulsations of Cepheids and, and uh, their other libraries are in a different uh, instability strip that, that have these uh, periodic pulsations. So, that's fairly well understood, uh, and that is not what's happening here, although it's not to say there's any relationship. Remember I showed you up at the top of R71 there, something like <coughs> pulsation, so 
somewhere in this, the outer layers of the star, some kind of pulsation and stability has uh, uh, been triggered by, by other things that are going on. But th these are major readjustments inside the star, uh, not in the nuclear reactions, but uh, in mass motions inside the star, uh, convection, moving material up and down. And uh, those are the kinds of things people think of as, as models. And there are models and, and, and uh, explanations of these things, but there's nothing yet which is so clear and definite that everyone accepts it as the, the last word. Here we have a question down front. Um, sort of similar. The, uh, you've done the orbital periods for these binaries, and could tidal forces play a role in, in causing this sort of massive dis redistribution? Okay, so the question is, can tidal forces pay, play a, a strong role in this massive redistribution? They can, and, uh, and uh, yes, they can even probably even trigger outbursts, uh, especially in some peculiar kinds of stars. Uh, so uh, sure, just like you know, the moon affects the Earth's ocean to form the tides. Uh, the same thing happens uh, in these closed binary stars. Of course, the closer they are, the more massive they are, the more extreme the effects. And um, you know, and you can study this. Uh, there, are, there it's, a, it's a fascinating detailed field of dynamics and about how they rotate and they revolve and then they get they get locked into synchronism as the moon is. By the way, <laughs> always the same face, the same side faces the Earth, and uh, they can affect each other. But one of the extreme effects that come to mind as you ask your question is, is so very eccentric binaries. And uh, uh, for whatever reason, there's some binaries which are very eccentric. Uh, that is to say, they're, they're almost linear. They, they have, uh, and the speed of, of the stars increases when they're close together, then decreases, and then increases, and they would buy each other. And uh, these periastrian passages, when they're close, oh, they're very close together, together, then there can be extreme effects. Uh, which uh, and, and some of these are binaries involving neutron stars, even black holes, which are extremely dense and, uh, and have very strong gravitational fields. And uh, you can get some kinds of explosions and outbursts and things which are triggered by probably by tides uh, at periastrian passages in, in eccentric binaries. Okay, uh, I have one last question for you. Uh, is Eta Carinae considered a luminous blue variable? <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. And, uh, Yes and no. Uh, it, uh, you'll find it included in uh, that diagram, up even higher. Uh, the, the thing about Eta Carani is, uh, because of our studies of it in great detail, it happens to be fairly close by, and, uh, and the stars it's associated with, which are some of the most massive stars, now 100, 200 solar masses, it's much more massive than, than these typical stars. We're talking about these tend to go, well, you can see uh, here, the masses are there, like from 40, there's some surprisingly low ones here, uh, but 40 to 80, say, is typical. Eta Carinae had an initial mass of 140 solar masses. And its outburst magnitude, when it had its huge eruption in the 19th century, was six straight magnitudes. Yeah. And uh, that's much larger than these, these as you were looking, if you're looking at my light curves, are typically three magnitudes. And uh, so, is it, is it the same phenomenon? More extreme? Or is it a different phenomenon? Yeah, that's exactly what I was wondering because don't know. it um, because it had such a huge outburst. We don't the, know. It was it is an eccentric binary, and uh, every uh, five five and a half years, uh, we've discovered now that uh, it gets close and it, uh, it has X-ray outbursts and things. Mm -hmm. and some people have argued that uh, the binary is so close, uh, and then the great eruption occurred near one of them. So you know, you can have something that looks similar. But it may have a completely different cause. Uh, maybe this one is caused by these periastrum passages of a close massive companion in an eccentric orbit. And uh, these are not. Although there are some people who want to argue that all LBVs these are binaries too. So that's where we are. Right. And especially since these uh, LBVs and Eta Car, et cetera, have these bursts that happen for years and decades. Um, and you have to watch them over much more than the, you know, a graduate student's lifetime, or even, you know, in some cases, more than an astronomer's lifetime. It well, makes it a quite a challenging problem. It does, but uh, that stimulates me to add something very fascinating here. We have an astronomer here, a German astronomer, his name is Armin Rest, and he specializes in light echoes. And these are a delayed arrival of, of light outbursts from supernovae. He started, and, and then he got into Eta Carini, of, uh, by light, scattered, uh, reflected from dust clouds along the line of path. And he, it's all worked out. It's very complicated, but they can do it. And uh, so he has gone into the Carina Nebula, and he has uh, discovered and observed uh, these knots 
which correspond to the historical brightenings of Eta Carani. And uh, he's even found some blue ones, and I think we have the spectrum of the outburst. You know, there were no spectrographs in 1837 when this happened. And now, with this technique, we've been able to go back and, uh, and get the spectrum of Eta Carani at outbursts in 1837 before we had any spectrographs. Isn't that amazing? And um, the thing about Eta Carani, one can let one's mind wander even further. Uh, it was reported by you know, Ptolemy and uh, I don't know who all as, as bright, um, much brighter than a normal star for centuries uh, back before this outburst in 1837. This is magnitude, fourth magnitude, way bright for um, a star, um, a small star in its association. So it was already doing something uh, centuries before uh, this outburst. Now, the Europeans are building a 40 meter telescope in Chile. Is Armand Rust or somebody <laughs> going to go back and get a spectra from 200 AD, 400 AD? Never say never in astronomy. Uh, you're likely to be wrong. <laughs> All right, this sounds like a good place to leave it. That we can, using the speed of light, look back in time, even at something that we know happened historically by looking at the echoes from it. So uh, these variable stars will, hope, will keep, uh, keep astronomers gainfully employed for quite some time. <laughs> All right, next month will be our look at Cassini's grand finale at Saturn with Bonnie Meinke. Let's give Nolan one more hand of applause. <laughs> Thank you for coming. We'll see you next month. You're a, you're a great audience. Uh, as far as I know, no. As far as I know, no. I have gotten the heat but it doesn't look like it. Just go to, it's, it's, I wonder if it's listed on here.